Mm -hmm. We So we do have a voice. And I think that the more women get involved and start to see that, it's really empowering. And then we can really start to move the needle together. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is all about creativity and hustle happening in and around the great state of Montana. Today, I got the chance to sit down with Aaron Switalski, the executive director of Women's Voices for the Earth. Women's Voices for the Earth is a very important nonprofit organization headquartered here in, in Missoula. They do work on a national scale, a ton of policy work and regulatory work in Washington, D.C. They've recently had some great success with negotiating with large corporations like Procter & Gamble. So their work, it really outstrips um, you know, their little home here in Missoula. And with, in our conversation with Aaron, we get into a lot of important issues. One, just kind of creating some awareness about the level of dangerous chemicals and the lack of regulations that exist um, involving, you know, many uh, household products and products that sort of are disproportionately exposed to women and why moms and women in general are sort of unfortunately the at the forefront of this issue and it's interesting to hear Aaron's perspective on why women's voices for the earth is so dedicated to women another thing that's interesting too is she's got a pretty strong philosophy about you know whether the world can be changed through sort of consumer action you know voting with your pocketbook or if if it just needs to be more regulatory in mind and uh, more policy driven so we have a, a cool exchange about that anyway women's voices for the earth they do amazing work and I enjoyed my conversation with Aaron and I hope you do as well <laughs> Okay, so we're here today with Aaron Switalski. Thanks, Aaron, for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Justin, for having me. Yeah, so you are the executive director of Women's Voices for the Earth. Yes. Uh, nonprofit organization headquartered here in Missoula. Yep. Um, my understanding is Women's Voices for the Earth is dedicated to trying to remove chemicals from a variety of different products, but chemicals that disproportionately affect women uh, in our community and, and in the world in general. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way of putting it. Our mission is really to amplify women's voices to eliminate the toxic chemicals that harm our health and our communities. And so we've primarily focused on chemicals that impact uh, women. Okay. We've been looking at industries in particular that heavily market and sell to women because we think the power of women can help change these industries. Okay, so well, I'd like to get into that that the sort of gender issue as we go. But before we get into that, can you give us a little bit of bio and how you kind of were drawn into this kind of work? Yeah, so it's interesting. I I kind of came into Women's Voices for the Earth by accident through okay. some other work that I was doing. And it was actually engaged in an effort. Um, we were doing an action, kind of a, a protest out at a Walmart with labor unions around some of their um, unfair labor practices. And when I was there, I met a couple of women. And, and they, you were there just as a, as a protester? I was there as a protester. Okay. And I met a couple of women who were there from Women's Voices for the Earth. Yeah. And it intrigued me because I wondered, well, why are you, you're an environmental organization, you know, why are you guys here? Sure. And they, you know, just really honed in on the fact that everything is interconnected and workers' rights are environmental rights and healthy communities rely on healthy workers and a healthy environment. And so for me, it was, um, it was really a way to see the environmental movement in a much broader way, and that was really appealing to me, yeah. where before it had just been about saving the you know, rivers and the trees, which is great, but you know, we can't forget that people live in this world, and together we need to have a healthy environment. Yeah, it kind of, it kind of brings it down to earth in a way, or that's a terrible choice of phrase, but, <laughs> but it kind of brings it, it internalizes it in a way that just feels much more tangible. Yeah, yeah. it's very personal. Yeah. And so from that initial touch point, you sort of, uh, like, what was what was then your entry strategy into Women's Voices for the Earth? Then, you know, I, I saw, started noticing the organization at multiple events, and then I heard about a job opportunity they okay. were hiring for, yeah, and yeah. they were hiring for a statewide campaigns organizer for their um, Mercury and Public Health campaign at okay. the time. And so I talked to them and applied and got the job and started working as a statewide campaign organizer. And had you been working in the nonprofit space or activism space, policy space before? Yeah, I worked, um, I started off, 
you know, I'd really been doing a lot of work through um, college. So I went to okay. University of Montana That's here. Right. And I have a degree in Spanish, mm -hmm. um, but I was engaged in political activism through my time here. I was on the board of Montperg. I was okay. um, a student senator um, with uh, the Associated Students. Um, and then I had been working with an organization called Community Action for Justice in the Americas, doing solidarity, cross-border solidarity work between Latin America and um, and Missoula here, where we'd bring labor organizers up to talk about different um, different concerns that they had and kind of do solidarity organizing. Sure. And then I uh, graduated and joined the AmeriCorps VISTA program and was placed at Homeward, which does affordable green-built housing here in Missoula. Mm. Um, and so I had really been drawn to this kind of civic engagement work um, and was excited to have the opportunity to connect that with, you know, environmental activism as well. Yeah, so, and Missoula is such a hotbed for this kind of <laughs> just way of thinking and these sorts of organizations. And so you, you, you get in the door at uh, Women's Voices for the yeah. Earth and you guys are, now you're doing a statewide campaign. So all of a sudden doing a bunch of travel and... Yeah, really just focusing on my my job was to build a coalition that could actually support um, legislation to phase out the use of mercury containing products in the state. Okay. So things like our thermostats on the wall used to have mercury mm -hmm. in them. Mercury thermometers, just all this unnecessary yeah, source that you'd of mercury. Yeah, things stick into a baby, right? <laughs> yeah, that, things that makes you stick into a baby. And then, you know, they always break and the mercury yeah. always comes out or you, you yeah. throw the old thermostat away and it breaks open and then it pollutes our rivers. Mm -hmm. And so it was just really an unnecessary source and uh, so we built a coalition to, with including Department of Environmental Quality, um, local county, Missoula County um, Health uh, Water Quality Department here. Sure. Um, and then just, you know, advocates, uh, conservation and um, reproductive health advocates, because this really had intersecting concerns where mercury is a great harm for uh, pregnant women. So we built this coalition, and after a few tries at the legislative session, we did end up passing a bill um, that discontinued um, the sale of mercury-containing thermostats here in Montana. Okay. And that was in 2005, I think, or 2007. Right. And you joined the organization in 05, is that yeah. right? And so the long tenure yep. there. How long have you been executive director? Since 2009. And to be clear, this yeah. is not just a Missoula organization. You guys are nationwide, have a worldwide reach. Yep. I was looking at your board of directors, some incredibly impressive people yeah. on the team. <laughs> I mean, you got world-class researchers, yeah. policymakers, yep. influencers. Yeah, it's <laughs> exciting. We've, you know, board building has been kind of a little project of mine. I uh -huh. love doing it. I think it's so important to build a strong team. And uh, there are women all over the country that care so much about this and that had such unique skills. And, you know, they're really interested in um, how our organization looks at so many intersections of issues. And I think there's some appeal, too, to us being a Missoula-based organization sure. that, you know, we're not – we're not sitting inside the D.C. Beltway trying to write policies that don't actually affect people's lives because there's no lived experience right, in them. Right. So we get, you know, once a year we bring the, the whole board out and they're coming out in two weeks and they get to come to Montana and we sit down and we, um, you know, strategize and, and build our organization, which is really exciting. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So let's get into why a women's organization? Why is it so? Why, why is that a core part of the identity? And, and, and yeah, yeah, just why women's? Yeah. So you know, our main focus is looking at toxic chemicals, right. and right now, um, out there in use in the environment, there are about over eighty thousand of chemicals that are in use. So these are things that are put into products. Um, that are, you know, coming out of stacks be through chemical processing. Okay. Um, and less than 200 of them, you know, a tiny percentage of them have actually been really thoroughly evaluated for their long-term health impacts. Yeah, can we just give an example of the sorts of ingredients and, and things where... Yeah. Just so people who might Absolutely. not be... People might not even have this on their radar screen. Yeah. So what are some of the chemicals and, and why should we care about them? So uh, mercury is one that people okay. are quite familiar with. Yep. There's yep. still mercury in some mascara. There's still lead really? in certain lipsticks. 
Um, we've been doing testing of uh, tampons and pads. We're finding things like chloroform, um, acetone. These are carcinogens. Phthalates is one that people have maybe started to hear a little bit about. Uh -huh. That's often found in fragrances. Yes. This is a chemical that's been linked to undescended testicles in newborn babies. All not kinds of these, not good things. And lots of times, you know, we're just wondering, why are these things even in there? And is there something that can be used instead so that we don't have to put any of this uh, potential risk yeah, into I the mean, products that we a, use? That's a question I would have is, why? Like, how does it come to be where a chemical like mercury or something gets into a product? I mean, it must serve some useful end in terms of product performance. And then maybe there's just total neglect with regard to downstream consequences? I, You know, I think there's probably a little bit of both. And one of the questions that we're always asking and that, you know, we do a lot of work campaigning for companies to tell us what they put in their products. Sure, transparency. And yeah, for transparency, not only around ingredients, but now we're really saying, and why do you put things in there? And what are the right. research studies that you have on these chemicals? Um, a product may perform really well, but what studies have you done to show that it's not going to cause a health harm or an environmental harm down the line? And that stuff really isn't publicly available right now. Um, I, we don't know to the extent what extent companies are doing this kind of testing, and that's a question that we're continually pushing for and sure. asking about. Although it does seem that examples abound of companies that know about the all the bad stuff that their either ingredients yeah. or their product or their product in general do negative effects that they've suppressed or tried to ignore or tried to keep out of the public eye yeah one really great recent example of this is talc okay. this is um a, it's a powder and it's you know the most obvious uh, use of it is in baby powder. Okay. I and mean, that's one that people are going to be familiar with, your Johnson & Johnson baby powder, their iconic product. Well, Johnson & Johnson also used to have a product called Shower to Shower, and this contained talc. And Shower to Shower was a feminine deodorizing product. So it was basically marketed to women. It was heavily marketed to women of color, which is another um, grave injustice, is that a lot of these products are heavily marketed to women of color. Okay. And um, they would use put it in their underwear after the shower. Well, this, you know, in the 1970s, women started um, complaining about health problems with this. And Johnson & Johnson, actually, we've uh, research has been uncovered now that shows they knew since 1970 that there's a potential problem with talc. And they worked really hard to come up with a way to cover up concerns about talc instead of actually just reformulating their product. So it's now come out, they've had multiple class action lawsuits, they've lost several lawsuits because women have proven that their ovarian cancer, and some women have died from it, um, has been a result of their daily use of this product for, Gosh. you know, 30 years. Yeah. And it's just, for us, we just don't, you know, it's like, why, just when a question arises, don't spend money, you know, on lawyers and marketing defense, like put that money into reformulating the product. Yeah. If yeah. you made a mistake or, you know, if things weren't known, because right now we live in a world where you can put things in until it's proven harmful, um, which it's rarely ever is because it's very hard to trace these things sure. back. But um, you really, you know, companies can really put whatever the heck they want in a product at okay. this point in the United States. They're very, I think we have about 10 restrictions on um, chemicals that can be used in particular, like in personal care products. The European Union has restricted over a thousand. Okay. So that just shows you, you a little comparison. Why do you think it is that companies um, are so hesitant to make those changes? I mean, you said, yeah, why not just take, you know, admit mistake, put the money, effort, resources, all of that into coming up with a product that's safe. Why do they double down on some <laughs> of these unsafe ingredients? You know, I, I don't know for sure. My guess is that um, they're, you know, they're probably – afraid that if they admit wrongdoing, they'll be hit with lawsuits. Sure, yeah, litigation. But now it's happening, you know, so they they need to get out in front of these things. Yeah. And we're seeing co companies start to do that now. Like, okay, we we think this chemical is on the radar of the public. We're going to switch out of it. Yep. We're going to find something else. 
Um, That's still just the way you frame that. So warped. Like this, <laughs> this chemical's on the radar of the public, not yeah. this chemical causes harm. Exactly. And that's a shift we're really trying to make. Yeah. So, for example, we've done a lot of work with the cleaning products industry. And we back at, when we started our campaign in 2007, there was no ingredient disclosure for this industry whatsoever. So you go to the store, you buy a cleaning product, you really have no idea what's in it. Mm-hmm. Um, we started to look into it. We started to research it, found some un, you know, undesirable ingredients, things like not household names because we're not that familiar with chemical ingredients because we don't ever see them. Yeah, we know Athenese. the basics like bleach, ammonia, blah, blah, exactly. blah. Exactly. Right. But 2-butoxyethanol, for example, yeah. not your household chemical name, no. linked to high rates of asthma. So women who are cleaning a lot were just getting lots of asthma. Um, Gosh. Yeah. You know, their children are getting asthma. And oftentimes, what do you do if you have, like, asthma or you're sick? You try to clean more. You try okay. to make your house cleaner, right? Yep, yep. Um, oh. So there was no ingredient disclosure whatsoever. And we did some market-based campaigns. We rallied, you know, supporters and women to contact companies. We called customer service mm-hmm. lines. We organized people to do action alerts and tied that with media publicity. And companies started voluntarily disclosing ingredients. Um And we were getting more and more voluntary disclosure until just um, last year, we actually passed legislation in California that now requires manufacturers to disclose ingredients and cleaning products. Okay. And that the companies came to the table to sit and negotiate that because the writing was on the wall. Like they're going to have to do this. So they want to be part of the legislation to actually, you know. But at least that's a collaborative approach. Yeah, and it took some nudging, of and yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, it, it takes they, some nudging. Yeah. But yeah, and that's you know, and that's so where we're headed now is okay. We have ingredient disclosure, and now we've built a roadmap to help companies ask the right questions about their chemical safety process. Okay, because we don't want to chase down one chemical at a time. Like that's just exhausting. Mm-hmm. It's exhausting for them. It's exhausting for us. You know, it's exhausting for consumers who are just trying to get safe products. Well, and it kind of gets you too in the minutia. I mean, not that yeah. that's, that's unimportant, but for exactly. you guys, like uh, in terms of messaging, it's it's much more, yeah, not to chase a one particular chemical. Yeah. And we can use one chemical to give, to, to showcase what's broken. Yeah. That's worked really well. But we, you know, we still don't even know what all of the chemicals are in these products. And so yeah. the idea is how do we get companies to stop making products that are, you know, not super risky for everyone, but instead inherently safe at their base. Okay. That's what we're ultimately aiming for yeah. so that nobody has to be a chemist at the grocery store. Like that's ridiculous. It is. It's just <laughs> too hard. Yeah, so it's too overwhelming. You know, and Aaron, I mean, I kind of meandered with a bunch of different questions, but yeah. the question I did ask you minutes ago was, you know, why a women's organization? Yeah. You've talked a, a little bit about yep. this with regard to how many of these chemicals sort of are, you know, women are more exposed to them on average than yeah. men in general. But um, yeah, so why why focus on the women, the, you know, yeah. the feminine piece? Yeah, so a couple of reasons for that. Um, One is that when it comes to toxic chemicals, a lot of the chemical studies that have been done right now, the research subject has been an adult, you know, 160 pound male in an occupational setting. Okay. So we know that, you know, women are typically smaller than that. And and they've also typically just looked at acute health impacts. So short term things like um, coughing or skin, um, skin irritation, okay. things like that. Um, but we know that women are different. And we also know that women have reproductive systems mm. that are very complicated and different. I think historically there's just been under uh, research on women's bodies in general. And when it comes to this question around the impact of toxic chemicals on women's bodies, this has been woefully under-researched. Yeah. And then we also do see the higher rates of exposure through certain products. So It seems like the cosmetic industry is, yes. is a classic example. Yeah. It's a classic example. Women on average use you know, 15 cosmetic products a day. Even if you're, you know, someone here in Missoula that doesn't wear much makeup. Sure. How about men? You Do you know, know the data? For, I mean, what's the I average? think the average is maybe five. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, because you that, still use right. some shampoo, some lotion, maybe deodorants, sure. maybe cologne. Toothpaste um, in that? Maybe that hair count gel in toothpaste. That? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so, uh, you know, all of those things add up pretty quickly. Okay. Um, so that's, and then the other reason we focus on women is that we very much believe women are going to be the change makers in this realm. Sure. You know, when you look at data around women and how they engage in voting on these issues, Mm -hmm. they, regardless of what party they're from, women tend to vote in favor of environmental issues more than men. Women tend to vote in favor of policies that are health protective for their families. Um, So when you, you know, regardless of what party they're from, regardless of what income level they're from. And so, you know, and also women tend to be more engaged in their community. So you see a lot of women at PTAs, involved at church, involved in book clubs, involved in all kinds of activities. These are the women who are going to make change in this industry. And we're seeing that happen. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of this is based on to some degree on traditional gender roles, but a lot of, in many instances, women are making a lot of the, the yeah. frontline choices on yes. what chemicals are interacting with their children. Yeah, right? absolutely. I think there's, you know, the stat that's out there is that women tend to make about 85, 80 to 85 percent of the purchasing choices for their household yeah. and about 80 percent of the healthcare choices in a household. So I, I guess the question I'm getting at, and I don't really have an elegant way of asking it other than you know, a lot of activist-oriented organizations think about, you know, this, well, in a perfect world, men and women, you know, these chemicals appro- you know, affect all humans. Yeah. Let's not, um, let's not sort of, I don't know if embrace is the right word, but let's not sort of acknowledge the premise of these traditional gender roles, whereas yeah. your organization appears to say, hey, this is the way, this is what the stats are saying. Let's attack the issue where it matters most. Is that yeah, an accurate I mean, way? It is. What I always like to when I'm talking about cleaning, for example, I always like to say, you know, we don't we don't focus on cleaning products because we think women should be cleaning. Right. We focus on it because the reality is that they are. You know, the stats still show that on in an average household, women still do seventy percent of the cleaning. You know, mm-hmm. they're using more of the personal care products. And a lot of this is because of the marketing. Yes. You know, the reality is that when you watch, it's starting to change, and I'm excited to see that. But in reality, when you watch commercials, you know, mostly they're marketing to women to do the cleaning marketing, you know, heavily marketing to women around cosmetics and putting out standards of cleanliness, standards of beauty, you know, putting out these ideas that women are, you know, buying into. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so we're trying to shift that like, okay, well, we're not going to buy into your standard of clean. A clean for me doesn't need to smell like a pine forest because actually that pine forest smell is a whole bunch of different chemicals mixed together that, and we don't know what they are. And it's actually makes me sneeze and cough anyway, you know, or whatever it might be. Or we've taken on the feminine care products. I mean, mm-hmm. this has been shocking that, you know, it's just sort of unbelievable how little research has been done about potential health impacts of feminine care products on a woman's body. I mean, basic, like there's just some basic stuff that companies don't do. They don't know how the how a product is interacting with what's called the vaginal biome. Like, how is the pH balance working? How is it? Things are um, very sensitive and dynamic, and companies just kind of slap pH balance labels on these feminine wash products. Sure. Those products, we found they contain things like octoxinol 9, which is a spermicide. It's not labeled as a spermicide. So women are sometimes buying products that they don't even know have a spermicide in. They might be trying to get pregnant. Gosh, yeah. You know, it's just yeah. these really basic things that I think have been ignored because um, we haven't really been out there asking these questions. With feminine care, it's been pretty taboo to even talk about for years. So that has really gone under the radar. And I think companies have just kind of enjoyed doing whatever they're doing without a lot of scrutiny until now. Do you think it's a blind spot that comes from maybe a male dominated sort of product development regime or managerial, you know, I'm just trying to imagine the, 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 the corporate structure that leads to these sorts of products with these sorts of ingredients. Yeah, I think that could be some of it. And then I think too, it's just, there's real lack of data 
And, yeah. you know, right now what the industry tends to do is equate lack of data with safety. And that is just a really bad precedent yeah. that's been set. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you have kindergartners. In kindergarten, you learn, you know, let's better safe than sorry. That is not how – that is not it. how the yeah. op- Nobody's falling the in that operates. hole in the classroom yet. I guess it's safe. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. No. So, so unfortunately, we live in this uh, other paradigm right now where it's like, well, until a whole bunch of people get really, really hurt – We don't really have to change the way we do business. Or until somebody asks enough questions and makes us look bad enough, we don't really have to change the way we do business. Which, you know, I mean, I'm trying to not necessarily play devil's advocate here, but you're you're trying to think about how, like, good people can fall into these traps, right? And so it might come from a place where you develop a product, you you feel like it meets needs, it provides a benefit in the marketplace. And that all's well and good. And, and it, yeah, maybe you've ignored certain negative consequences that you didn't think of. Yep. But then it starts making money, right? And then <laughs> you have to make your earnings reports for shareholders. Yeah. And all those things, I can see how those yeah. would contribute to, oh, we found a problem. Well, let's ignore that. Let's, let's sort of uh, – Let's not open that door, if you will. Yeah, exactly. I think that's true. And I think that's why our organization has to exist. You know, we worked really hard to um, connect with Procter & Gamble for years and years Uh and years. And we were not getting very far. And so we um, decided to to meet them at their on their home ground. And we showed up at their annual shareholder meeting. Okay. Um, And since then, we've been talking to them every two to three months. Right. And they, you know, we we had a protest outside their shareholder meeting. We had tested their products. We had tested some Always pads. Yep. Found acetone, found chloroform, found just some really questionable things. And all we wanted to know is why are these things in there? What do you know about these? You know, how are you working to make the product safe? And what are you disclosing about your product? Um and since then, they've started to work on that. You know, they're they're not sure why some of those things are in there, and they're working on it. And some of this is supply chain issues. Yep. We understand that this stuff is complicated, and we're not faulting companies for that. But we're just we're trying to shift the paradigm to to help realize that we want these processes to be safe from every point. You know, from extraction to disposal, mm-hmm. like. This whole chain of production and consumption, it should be clean and healthy. And we think we're innovative enough that we can do that as a society. And companies are really innovative. And so if they take some of their, you know, they have really great marketing campaigns. Perhaps some of that marketing money could instead go into R&D around for green chemistry, for finding solutions. Like, let's make sure the very basic building blocks of our products are not petro-based chemicals that are contributing to climate change, but maybe these are bio-based feedstocks and these can be healthy, you sure, know? Sure, Just to look at things in I mean, a new way. Yeah, and, and the, what you're coming with is, is certainly a reasonable perspective and reasonable objectives. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago the lack of, of data in certain instances. And, I, you know, yeah. I was thinking throughout this conversation about what are the sort of sources of data and the – constituents yeah. or participants that create that data. So I assume you've got the companies doing some of their own testing in some areas better than others. Yeah. And then you've got regulators, but you've also got, you know, academic researchers, third-party researchers. You've got to probably ask questions about who's funding that research and yeah. all these different sources of data. Um, how do you guys operate in that space? Yeah. So what we typically do when we – Whenever we start a campaign is we start by looking at the science. Mm -hmm. So our director of science and research, um, she does basically a lit review. And so she rounds up any literature that's out there that we can find. Lots of the studies that are found are independent research. There's very little regulatory research available on this stuff. Um, Sometimes we have some EPA data. Sometimes we have some National Institutes of Health data. Um, a lot of the research is industry-funded research. And sometimes when you start digging into the citations, you can't actually 
get to a source that shows the actual study, which is pretty troubling. Oh, you can't get to the source data? Yeah, you can't always get to the source data, even in the journals that it's published in. Interesting. And I'm like, well, that's fascinating. We've done a couple reports kind of exposing this because they're – there are these sort of quasi-regulatory bodies right now that are really in charge of cosmetic safety. And they're essentially who our government relies on. This yeah. is who the FDA is relying on to um, to make a call about whether a product is safe. And they have really, you know, they have a lot of gaps in the data knowledge and also just a lot of inherent conflicts of interest sure. with the industry. Um so the data is a challenge. So, you know, we round it up from wherever we can. But a lot of times what our work is pointing out is here's what we know about a certain chemical. We may not have research on how this chemical is um, is working in this particular product or what health impact it's going to have from this intended use of this product. But we have we have research about a chemical itself. Okay. Um, and so that's where we start to ask questions like, well, how have you done? What is the research you've done? Because you are the company who has to make sure your products are safe. Mm-hmm. And so we're asking right now for them to make that research publicly available. And Procter & Gamble actually just put out, um, I think it was last month, their 2030, um, it's like 2030 sustainability goals or something like that. Um, and they are pledging to make public a lot of their research. So this message is starting to be heard and we're, you know, we're excited to see progress and see that, you know, okay, maybe we're wrong about all of this. Then let's put out the research. Let's, let's see it. Um, and let's open this conversation up further. So, and that leads me into kind of a question about uh, and, and this is more in your wheelhouse as executive director, I, I would suppose it's like you've got this portfolio of tools to affect change. Um, part of those tools are affecting consumer demand, getting consumers yeah. to put, you know, to vote with their dollar bills, to vote with their pocketbook, so to speak. But then you've also got activism and yep. engagement and a lot of the successes you, you've, you've mentioned in, in this conversation have stemmed from first step was a protest, perhaps. Yep. Um, so how do you view this, uh, you know, the different levers you can pull to to affect change in this space? Yeah. So, I mean, our basic strategy is to kind of engage and mobilize women. And so we do this through our corporate campaigns and then through policy-based campaigns. Okay. So we have right now corporate campaigns on cleaning products, on feminine care products, on um, Brazilian blowout, a um, hair, really dangerous hair straightening product. Um, and then we also engage women to actually send, you know, letters to their Congress people. We've done um, rallies in um, D.C., lobby days in D.C. on legislation. Right now, we're working mostly in California and New York on policy. Uh Um, And so it's a mix of kind of organizing and mobilizing women towards our specific campaign goals. That's really what our strategy is. Okay. And and within that, too, what's the balance between... um, you know, changing individual level behavior versus changing regulation. Like, where do you yeah. think, you know, where do you move the ball the greatest distance? I, I don't know what analogy to use there, but you get what I'm asking. Yeah. So, I mean, we actually have lots of tips and resources on our website. So, sure. yeah, yeah. Because a lot of times people are not thinking about the, the advocacy when they come to our organization. They, um, a lot of times women have gotten pregnant and they're suddenly concerned about yeah. the health of their yeah. unborn baby. And so we have, oh, pregnancy and toxic chemicals. Like, what can you do as a pregnant woman? Mm-hmm. So we have fact sheets. We have top 10 tips for reducing your exposure, things okay. you can do in the house. Um, we have a business partners program. So we actually do partner with companies. Um, we have partnerships with Seventh Generation, yep. with the Honest Company, um, Sustain. They do um, condoms and feminine care products, uh-huh. um, NatraCare, several companies. They're on our website. And so we are trying to show that it's possible to have safe and healthy products. It's not like you just can't have anything. Sometimes access is limited to those products, whether geographically you just can't get it or you don't have enough money. Mm -hmm. Um, Or, 
hey, you're a homeless woman and you need a tampon, it's going to be whatever you can find. You're not going to worry about, you know, which one you're getting. Um, So we, you know, I think it's a real entry point to want to change your own life. And that's great. And that's also things we should all do because it does move the market. Yes. And so to the extent that we can make safer choices, it's great. And it helps in the household. Um, there have been really interesting pieces of research about, um, like, it was a, um, a biomonitoring study where um, they tested urine samples of, of women. There's been a couple of different kinds. So one example is um, you basically these women gave a urine sample and were tested uh-huh. for um, BPA, bisphenol A, which is a chemical that's found like in can linings. Yeah, and, and that in was other a big water plastics. bottle scandal years ago. Yes. And algae and others. Yeah. Exactly. And um, these women, um, you know, got their levels tested and then they had to work to not eat. I think they just didn't eat canned food for a week. And their levels of the BPA dropped in the in the secondary urine sample. Okay, um, that's also happened with cosmetics testing. A group of teens, low income teens out of California, did this, where it was um, phthalates was the chemical they were testing for, and they had a baseline level of this chemical. They stopped using their regular cosmetics and used other alternative products, and their level of phthalates had dropped in a week. So you can, you know, you can make some personal changes in your own exposure, and that's important. Um, and so we have tips and recommendations and suggestions for other products to buy on our website. Sure. But then we also want people to start taking the next step because the reality is, like, we can all change our products, but there's still so many, you know, we will never be able to shop our way out of this problem okay. ultimately. So yeah. let's... Let's make some shopping changes that we can. And some just aren't realistic, especially if you are a person living here in Missoula, like buying an $8,000 flame return free couch, not really on the, on the table for most sure, of us. Sure, um, So we have, to, we have to get the manufacturers to change and to ultimately change um, the system. And that's what, we're, that's what we're looking to do is provide women a gateway, information they can come in, and then we help them take steps to start taking action. And it's been really encouraging because, you know, we like after we did the um, protest at Procter and Gamble, you know, it was like okay, we showed up and they put up ingredient disclosure pages for their tampons and pads that day. Yeah, you guys now have a place and, at the table. Just yeah, you know, regular discussions. And we just the response we got from one was like, I can't believe we did it. We actually did it. Like yeah. we changed a multinational company. Mm-hmm. We so we do have a voice, and I think that the more women get involved and start to see that, it's really empowering. And then we can really start to move the needle together. Yeah. And as in your in your role as executive director, like as we think about this, Aaron, I just think like I mean, the the this was the title of a book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, about public <laughs> health, right? That this is one yeah. of those things that is so big, yeah. so vast. How do you <laughs> as a leader of this organization set parameters? What's you know, what are the guardrails yeah. for this is the sort of issue we're gonna get into, this is what we're not gonna touch. Like we're going to stay on cosmetics. We're not going to do yeah. food. Uh, where do you kind of draw these lines and how? Yeah, it's it's hard. Yeah. Um, but what we – so we actually have just wrapped up a big kind of 10-year strategic visioning process. Okay. And we have just been really clear that, okay, we're, we see this as a huge systemic problem of toxic chemicals in our lives coming from various sources. But where we can make an impact is focusing on the product, the industries that most heavily and intimately market to women. Okay. And so that's where we narrow our focus. So currently it's looking at cosmetics, cleaning products, um, fragrance, which spans actually a number of industries, um, salon products, feminine care products. Um, and then where we're looking to in the future is apparel textiles. It's a, that's a really, really dirty industry. Mm. That one is challenging, though, because it's, it's, the solutions are just not as tangible. Like really finding a, an easy, um, better solution around apparel right now is pretty hard. Um, so that is something that it's really – that's starting to evolve. But what we're also concerned about is – well, gosh, if, you know, here in the U.S. we have exposures, 
But where these chemicals are sourced and manufactured, um, the chemical processing plants, those communities are really, really harmed. And so that's the other thing is how can we, you know, start to change things so that it can um, trickle back to those communities eventually and say, okay, well, let's clean up these chemical processing plants. Like all of these people are very sick because these chemicals are being processed in their communities. Those are ending up in our products. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's actually a a surprisingly large amount. Um, I think it's about 40% of what is going through a chemical processing plant ends up back out in consumer products. Wow. It's, it's a lot. So it's scary. Yeah. Um, and so through that, really, that work is, we know that's not our work. That's not what we directly do. But that's where we um, forge partnerships uh-huh. and allyships to try to um, support other organizations. Yeah. yeah. And I guess this is, you know, we, we had this conversation before we, we started recording. But, um, you know, some of these, these impacts that or the, you know, the effects of exposure to these chemicals, are the common things like cancers and, and asthma yeah. and other sort of very kind of salient, known, discrete outcomes in a way. And But one of the things you brought up were, you know, a lot of these chemicals or some of these chemicals are being found to have effects on our adrenal system and, yeah. and things that maybe operate in terms of um, suboptimal health in ways that are less clear to observe. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, you know, what the kind of biggest example right now is um, the case of endocrine disrupting yeah. chemicals. So yeah. these, there are so many um, chemicals that are put into products that are basically the effect that they're having is that they're mimicking how our hormones function. Mm-hmm. And this has huge implications for our reproduct- reproductive systems. And um, there's an organization called uh, the Endocrine Exchange where they, um, they're they amazing. They do incredible research on this, and they have actually been able to look at the impacts of um, endocrine-disrupting chemicals at different periods during a woman's pregnancy okay. and figure out, like, what the potential health effects are. For and the mom do, or for the baby? For the or baby. For both? Okay. And it okay. could be that, you know, it's like, gosh, I, if the mother was exposed to this tiny, tiny, tiny amount of yeah. this chemical in her first trimester, like the baby's now, you know, 10 times more likely, and I'm making these stats up, but, you know, 10 times more likely to have learning disabilities. Sure. I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, It's but it's got these really um, specific health effects. Yeah. And what that tells us is that, the way that most of the um, assessment for chemicals is done right now is that companies are they're doing a risk assessment. And so they're assuming that this chemical is safe if used in this amount. You know, if it's if the product is used the way that it was intended, and they say this amount of chemical is safe, and then they basically say, And we're going to add a thousand times to that to Mm. make sure we have a window. Okay. But what we're finding with these um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, these hormone mimickers, is that 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 rule is just doesn't uh, it doesn't work that way. So we're actually seeing sometimes greater health effects from a tinier exposure than if you had a large dose exposure. So it's really turned everything on its head, and we just you know. It just makes it all the more clear to me that the right question is not how much is safe, but okay, if there's risk to this, let's not use it. Let's find something that's inherently safe to the best that we can. And those solutions are still being developed and worked out, but that's the goal and that's where we need to start to get. And I think right now we at least have enough data on so many of these chemicals to say like, whoa, you're flagged. We're gonna we're gonna look for something that sure. has the same function, but that's not so flagged. Or, mm-hmm. you know what? We can't find anything. We can't find a chemical that's safer. Do we need this product? Because maybe we really don't. 
Like that's another question we need to ask. Mm. And that's mm. something that I, you know, that we ask women all the time too is like, you know, do you need a spray cleaner and a bathtub cleaner and a toilet bowl cleaner? And, you know, all these cleaners that are marketed for a specific purpose, sure. yeah, yeah. when really what you need is a spray bottle of vinegar and water. Mm-hmm. That's what we use to it clean does with the it. Job. It yeah. does the job. Yeah. So, so yeah. Gosh, Aaron, so many, I mean, it's, this is like questions lead to questions. And, and, yes. And um, we can go down <laughs> many, many rabbit holes, but just inspired by the kind of ability of your organization to tackle such a colossal problem and put together a set of real wins. I mean, you guys are doing amazing work and that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's exciting, yeah. <laughs> so how can, how can people interested in getting involved, learning more, whether it's making changes in their personal life or going to a protest or engaging or writing letters, how can they learn more about yeah. your work and, and get, get involved? Yeah, our website or our Facebook page are great places to get involved. Uh, the website is womensvoices.org. Okay. Um, you can find us on Facebook at Women's Voices for the Earth. Um, and just sign up for our e-news. Just start there. You get a newsletter. Um, our website has lots of resources, tips, fact sheets, information. And if you want to start taking action, we'll send you action alerts. You can sign up for text alerts. Um, lots of ways to get involved and lots of levels of engagement available too. Super. Well, Aaron, thanks for sharing your story with us and uh, all the best in your important work. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Thanks for having me. All right. That was a fun one. Inspiring work by Erin and her team over at Women's Voices for the Earth. I encourage you to check out their website and get involved and learn more. Learn more about what you can do both at the household level, but also um, as far as getting involved in a protest. I mean, you heard that that was her entry path into this line of work, and um, it's pretty inspiring. All right. Coming up next week, we've got Bjorn Nabosny, another Missoula legend the co-founder of Big Sky Brewing. So it was a super fun interview. We did it on location and I'm excited to bring that to you next week. Remember that A New Angle was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They're one of the largest electrical wholesale companies in the country with nearly 600 locations nationwide. CED is a privately owned business-to-business company that distributes just about every piece of equipment to keep your lights on, your energy flowing, and your lifestyle comfortable. CED is also an important employer in Missoula, and they have a keen interest in University of Montana graduates. To explore career opportunities, check out www.cedcareers.com. Moving forward, if you have any suggestions for guests, cool people doing awesome things with creativity and hustle, please let us know. And if you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. First, rate us on iTunes. Ratings help others find the show. Second, write a review. The more reviews we get, and hopefully positive ones, the more we can grow. And third, please just tell your friends about it. In addition, you can support A New Angle financially. For information on sponsorship opportunities, please visit our website, www.business.umt.edu slash a new angle. There you will also find a link to support the pod. Before we go, I'd like to thank a few people for making this project happen. First of all, Elizabeth Willey, Communications Director here at the University of Montana College of Business. I'd also like to thank recent UM graduate Michelle DeFluke and our fabulous interns Savannah Sletton and Max Gibson. And a special thanks to VTO for providing the show with music. Finally, thanks to my producer, Stefan Borson. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot and see you next time.